Hi everybody, welcome to the concluding session of Beth Alita's mini-series on prophets and prophecy. Um, in a, a deeply uh, tender way, we're going to be concluding with uh, an exploration of the, the special Haftorah for Shabbos Nachamu, for the Shabbos of Comfort that always follows, uh, follows Tisha B'Av. It's a beautiful confluence of events because um, the, you know, we were just talking about this in the discussion before we started recording. You know, the Jewish calendar really does its work on our experience of life. And we felt this like increasing heaviness and narrowness and challenge of the three weeks and as they moved into the nine days. And our class kind of tracked and tacked to that uh, theme in its exploration of God's judgment, of God's critique. We saw the ways in which that critique and that judgment were motivated by concern and by a passion for justice and by a, a deep uh, empathy for the human condition and trying to shift our attention towards caring for everyone, not just our convenience. But um, we know we've gotten a very, like, uh, Dean, Sedek kind of st side of the prophetic equation and today's class is going to balance it with uh, chesed, with love. And it is a love, I think, again, that undergirds all of the prophecies that we've seen before, all of the warnings, all of the judgments, all of the criticisms, that they've all come from a place of passionate concern and love. But here we're going to have the comfort that follows challenge, or the, the comfort that is offered to someone who has lost. Uh, and this is appropriately the Haftorah of Nachmu. Now, the called Shabbos Nachmu after this Haftorah. The Haftorah is uh, found in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 26, and it's the beginning of what people call Second Isaiah. Um, now, some people think that there are multiple Isaiahs or multiple prophets who are in the book of Isaiah, and other people say that there's kind of like different movements within Isaiah's prophesizing. Regardless, we see a break between 1 to 39 and 40 through the end of the book. Um, that there's a shift in tone. All of, if I remember correctly, all of the seven Haftorahs of Consolation, the Shiva de Nechimta, right, so we've left the Tlas de Puranusa, the three weeks of consequences, of judgment. Now we're moving into seven whole weeks, seven weeks of comfort. I find that actually an immensely moving uh, aspect of the Jewish calendar, that comfort is A, what is needed after the difficulty and the strictures of the three weeks of judgment, that God recognizes that we need care and, and comfort after those, after those challenges. And B, if you, that's retrojective, right? Looking at what it follows. But then projectively, looking at what it is leading up to. Comfort is also what's needed to give us the ballast and the support that we need to do the work of tshuva. Right, so comfort on one hand is comforting us from loss, and on the other hand is providing the emotional support Jews need to start a different, a very different style of a challenge. But it's not a spiritual challenge of mourning or of, um, of, of, of narrowing our lives, but it's actually one of going deeply into ourselves and uh, per actually maybe starting to be the one who is offering the critiques of ourselves. And thus, all the more reason that God's comfort is coming to give us the emotional support we need to do that kind of work. So, second Isaiah, or the second part of Isaiah, is full of immensely beautiful images of love, of continuity, of the kinds of messages that we saw actually at the tail end of the first chapter of Jeremiah as well, of the romance of the youth, of the long-standing connection between us and God, um, and also a... a, a, a proliferation of beautiful images of the way in which desiccation or death will never win out. Roni akara lo yalada, right? The, 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 barren, um, the barren woman will actually rejoice who has not given birth. And it's actually that this is a condition that is not something that consigns her to some kind of fate, but rather that all these conditions are things that pass and that can be, invo and can be um, intervened on, uh, in, in, on. Okay, um, so um, this is Shabbos Nachmu. It's named after this Haftorah. And we'll see that, it, that its comforting aspect is in the first two verses. And then for the rest of it, it's not clearly about comfort anymore. But I want to try to see the ways in which comfort and love 
are still in, in a more subtle, more dialectical way, still present in the text. So let's jump into it. Um, okay. There's also a beautiful song um, by Safam um, that set this set these verses to music. I don't know if you've heard it, but feel free to YouTube it. It's a it's it's a lovely tune. It's very like old school Jewish musicy, but it's uh, well old school like 1970s Jewish musicy. But it's uh, it's a real treat. Um, the source sheet is opening. <laughs> Sorry, just give it a minute. Um, in the meanwhile, though, are people familiar with this with this uh, haftorah? Have people seen it? Are people familiar with the thematics? Okay. Um, Yeah, open to you. I'm sorry. Every year we read it after um, every year. Uh -huh. oh, sorry. This is the half Torah that we read every year on the Shabbat after Tisha B'Av, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Sorry. No, no, no. Okay, there we go. Uh, can everyone see the source sheet? Great. Again, it's not like this is being recorded. Um, so I want to start by I want to start by looking at um, not just the Haftorah itself, but also trying to look at what it is, what the context is coming from. So to, as um, as Lauren just reminded us, this is the Haftorah that comes immediately after after Tisha B'av. So I want to look at it as specifically a follow up to Tisha B'av, that makes sense. So here we have a verse from Eicha. It says, B'chay sif kebalayla. Bitterly she weeps in the night, right? She being the metaphorized verse in Jerusalem, which is gendered as feminine. V'dimasa al lechya. Her, her cheeks are, are, are stained with tears. Ein la minachem. She has no comforter. Not like a blanket. She has no one to comfort her. Mikol uh, ohaveha. All of her friends are like fake friends. They've all betrayed her. And all of her allies also have done her wrong. They've become her foes. So the image in Eicha, and this is, I think, and this is the kind of radicalism, I think, of Tisha B'av, is that Tisha B'av takes the experience of destruction and of loss really seriously, in the sense that it in Lamentations and in the experience of the day, it doesn't try to explain it away and say, oh, you know, this is just, this is all a lesson, or, you know, this is all this, that, the other. It, it's very deeply in the experience of betrayal, of destruction, of the depths of despair. And I think it's actually, what's radical, I think I'm really radically permissive about it, is that it also, it, it, it accurately and aptly um, holds the experience of what grief entails. It's one that refuses explanation, refuses justification. It's in that experience of loss. So it's true in that moment. She has no one to comfort her. I, I, what I mean to say is that Tisha B'Av is, is deeply experientially true. In the beginning of the day, the nighttime and in the morning, it's deeply experientially true and theologically radical in that it refuses theodicy. It refuses the justification of pain through God, right? That God explains away all the bad things by saying, you know what, it's, you know, there's no darkness without light and all that stuff. It's just, this is what it was, and it hurt, and it was awful. Um, and in, that, in those times, you feel there's no one to help me. You feel that. And then Nachmu comes, not on the day of, but in the wake of the experience. And I think people who have, who have suffered a loss understand that it is, a, it is something that is, it's not progressive, right? Two steps forward, three steps back, but it is something that changes over time, right? That the experience of loss changes over time as you make sense of it, as you're able to integrate it into your life. And then you're able to, in small ways, start to reconnect, start to reach out, start to find comfort and support. So we move from this experience of there is no one to comfort her to, and this is from a future Haftorah of Isaiah, not this week's. It says, Shtayim heina krosayich miyanudlach. Two things have fallen you, rack and ruin. 
Hashur Vashever, Rak and Ruah, Rav Acherev, Mi Anachamech. How, and me is an interesting word, because here in context it means, how can I comfort you? It's an incredible statement, because who's the speaker? I know we don't have the context here, but take a guess. Who's the speaker? And this is a model of prophet as, as, as giving the, the word of God, right? So who's the speaker? Really? Well, Isaiah is speaking God's words. Yeah, that's right. Isaiah is speaking God's words. Right, so it's God, effectively. God is asking a question of insufficiency. How can I comfort you? I don't know how. There's an incredible midrash incredible midrash found in Pasik the Daraf Kahana Necha and also found elsewhere as well in which God is just absolutely confounded how to mourn and has to look for human examples from the Bible to figure out what to do to mourn the destruction of Jerusalem and it's an astounding midrash because like a the theology answer is that God's in charge of that. God caused the destruction in Jerusalem. So why is God mourning it? But as we're going to see that there's a way in which God is not just the agent, not just the subject, but also with us in this. That God is experiencing it with us. And not just that, but actually in some ways is lost. Because God, as an infinite, omniscient, omnipotent deity, doesn't know how to lose. And God has to look to human, to finite human beings, to figure out what it is to mourn. It's an incredibly daring midrash. It's an amazing thing. I hate to just like gesture to it. But here God is asking, how do I do this? How, I mean, either how, like literally give me instructions, I don't know how, or how can I? I, I, don't, I don't know how. Like, I, how, how could I ever comfort you? Um, it, it's, it's, an astounding, it's an astounding sentiment because we've moved now from there's no comfort available in Tisha B'Av to this statement in which God is saying, I recognize the, the, the loss, I recognize the pain, but I'm, I'm at a loss in terms of how to respond. So there still is no comforter yet. Because God, it seems, wants to be, but can't quite attain that, that, that role. So then, that's precisely why we have the Haftorah of Nachamu now. And Ibn Ezra, in his commentary on, on the Haftorah, says that these two Haftorahs are, these two, you know, this Haftorah is directly after Tisha B'av, because it says, not just that, but also in the preceding chapter of Isaiah, it says, all the treasures of the king and even his sons will be carried away to Babylon. This sad prediction is properly followed by the words of comfort. So comfort is not just something that is seen as nice, but comfort is something that is seen as necessary. That comfort has to follow the sad prediction. What does that say? I think it's saying something about prophecy, right? Because this is a class that is about prophecy, not just about the Haftorahs. It's about prophecy. And saying something about prophecy writ large. That it is not, it is a refusal of pessimism. It is not doomsaying, despite Jeremiah and his Jeremiahs, despite lamentations. Prophecy has never been about dooming people. It has always been about two things. Warning people, or trying to get people to understand consequences. And two, caring for people. So the, more, the comfort comes after the challenge. The soft words come after the difficult. Usually you say a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Here we say, you didn't take your medicine, 
right? You didn't take the medicine. So what do you do? Put this in a parental lens, right? The child misbehaved. What do you do? You punish them. Okay, so that's one option, right? Is that is it's to, it's a deterrent option. You didn't take the medicine. I'm going to punish you to make sure you learn you take your medicine. That's something you're not allowed to do. You sure. don't not take your medicine. And because yeah. of that, you did something wrong, and I'm going to punish you. I mean, in the case of literally not taking your medicine, you're going to get your own punishment because you're just going to get more sick. <laughs> okay, good. So first of all, something bad is going to happen anyway. And then the question is, who's the one who's going to help us learn the lesson? And how do you help you learn the lesson from that? So here what we have, it seems, is a model of love following, let's call it mistaken. That after someone screws up, God brings comfort. This is like someone getting, exp you know, like suspended from school, right? And then the parent can like double down on that punishment, or the parent can provide comfort, can provide support after, you know, the kid has already been through the ringer. So here what we have is God giving us something that's very challenging to hear in chapter 39, which we didn't look at, but still. Or we can just say, God giving us something that's very hard to experience. The three weeks, the nine days, Tish above. And then what follows that isn't upbraiding and grinding your face into it, rubbing salt in the wound, why aren't you better yet? What follows it is love. Because that's the way that you help people grow. Or that's the way you respond to someone when they've gone through something that they've had to go through. As you provide them with comfort afterwards. I know, sweetie. I know. That's Shabbos Nachman. It's the relief that comes after loss. It's the comfort that comes after loss. So Nichum Avelim, comforting the morning, comforting the mourner, is A, a mitzvah, and B, one of the mitzvahs that we're supposed to, it says actually explicitly in the Gemara and in the Midrash, that we're supposed to imitate ourselves after God. That God is the model for Nechum Aveli. God is a model for what it means to comfort the mourner. And that we're explicitly told to mimic ourselves, model ourselves after that divine behavior. Again, as we've said a couple few times, it's never the aspect of God's judgment that we're instructed to imitate. It's always the aspects of God's care. So uh, to, to recap this, like, this theme I'm trying to draw, and this is going to carry us through the rest of the, the, the class, Tisha B'Av I'm framing as an, as, as an experience of necessity. Everyone loses. You lose someone in your life that's special. You lose something that happens to you. You go through a challenge. We lost Jerusalem. It's something in a way that couldn't be avoided. Yes, we could have avoided it if we listened, but we didn't. We just didn't have it in us. God in, rec ah. God in recognizing that we, God, this, what this is, is an act of forgiveness. God is recognizing we didn't have it in us to, to listen. We got the consequences enough. It's enough. No more, right? God's not grinding our face into it saying, why won't you change yet? God is providing comfort because we went through what we had to go through. Okay. I think actually I'll save this midrash maybe till the end. It's a really it's a really cool midrash on the uh, from Sigdra on it. But let's uh, let's look at this. Let's look at these famous lines. So this is, this is the beginning of the Haftorah. It says, Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami, Yomar, Lokechem. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Dabru al lev Yerushalayim v'kiru eleha ki mal'a tzva'ah ki nirza avinah ki lakcha miyad Hashem ki flayim b'chol chateseh. 
It says, speak tenderly. It says, speak to the heart of Jerusalem. I'll lave Jerusalem, the heart. And call to it, to her, ki mal'at sivaah. That your time of service, right, seva, like the, like, the name, like the word for army or draft, your time of service is over. In other words, you've gone through enough of what you've had to go through. Ki nirtsa avona. Your avon, your transgression, your sin, has been fulfilled. You have exhausted it. There's no more of it left. Your sin is, and this is something that's very, very important in, let's say, Judaism theologically versus Christianity, um, is that, um, is that um, we do not have a notion of sin as something that cannot be gotten rid of, but sin is by its very nature something that is, uh, I wouldn't call it transient, but something that is transitory. It is not something that just passes on its own per se, but it is something that is uh, not a permanent stain. Right? We 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 saw this in the last two weeks. Right? We had this notion of you know you think you can scrub away your sin, but you can't scrub away a tattoo. And then then last week though it says, uh, well actually, what's amazing about God is that God can scrub God can scrub you clean. God can cleanse you. God can even get rid of what you thought was a permanent stain. That's the force of tshuva. It does miracles. So here what we have is this reinforcement idea that sin is something that is by its very nature time-bound. Sin is never something that is seen as natural. Sin is never something that is seen as original. Sin is something that is accidental. It happens to you. And it's also something then that is finite in that it is either done it is either done away with with chuva as Lauren just said in the chat, or it's something in a sense that does go away because of your experiences. There's a notion of um, yisurin shel ahava of suffering in your experience as actually something that 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 forgives you. <laughs> I.e., there's a notion of limits. Right, that like people are only expected to have to go through so much in their lives, and if they go through things that are challenging, literally the Gemara says, "What's an example of like suffering that like helps you like deal with your stuff?" Is like literally reaching into your pocket to get a nickel and you get a dime. Even something as like minorly annoying as that is still seen as like, okay, he's suffered. You've suffered enough. <laughs> You've suffered enough. You don't need to suffer anymore. Um, so nirtsa avona, that your sin has found favor, has found ratzon, has found ritsui, some kind of sense of satisfaction. Um, there really is a sense, I think, like a tender, caring sense for human finitude. That God is recognizing that we've suffered enough. And because of that, while maybe life isn't perfect anymore, it's not that we what that what we have is like sin hanging over our head. And not just that, but it says ki lakham yad Hashem ki flying bechol That we've we've received from God double the punishment for all our sins. I think that in some ways is a um, it's it's exaggeration, it's poetic license. But the point here is that is saying, it's you. We've reached a limit. God recognizes Israel has suffered enough. To say that Israel needs to suffer more, to heal, to grow, is not justice, but punitiveness. We get the difference here, right? That the difference is we've moved. If you think that punishment is everlasting. That something in you is permanently bad and needs to be permanently hurt? That's not justice anymore. Because justice has a sense of equity. Justice has a sense of fairness. Justice has a sense of proportion. If you believe that you have to be punished constantly and consistently, that's not justice. That's pure punishment. That's punitiveness. Yeah, very much. I would say it's A... It's a traumatic style of thinking, and B, it is actually a style of traumatizing discourse that I think, unfortunately, we're all too familiar with now. Right? A notion of um, 
trying to identify the bad and not actually having a way of dealing with it. Instead, just isolating, labeling, what have you. Um, so I want to focus on this word, nachamu, nachamu, right? So the word nechama, right, means comfort. And the word is double, too, right? We see, and I think that's a very beautiful reflection, right? So it's punish, it, we've received double the punishment for all of our sins, and God is bringing double the comfort. So nachamu, nachamu, the Malbim says, Atem hanavim nachamu asami. Your, you prophets comfort my people. Aho! So now we see a new model of the role of the prophet. Before we've seen prophet primarily as somebody bringing God's message to the people to challenge them, to critique them. But the prophet is also a bearer of God's love, a bearer of God's comfort. And this is an incredible point. It says, V'yan she'agula tavoy o'kodem azman mitzad z'chus o'im yikablu onsham. And it's either that redemption is going to come either before it's supposed to because of merit or because we've taken our lumps. So I want us to actually pay attention to that idea. A very adorable dog is making it hard to concentrate. Um, the, um, right, so I want to pay attention to the idea. Redemption is either coming on time or early. What, what's not the option? Wait. Yeah, well, or not, right? So, I mean, what's fascinating here is, right, so when does it, it comes early if we do tshuva, right? If we have merit. Zchus. I think that means if we do tshuva, it comes early. Or, and I think this is really actually quite powerful, our experience brings it. It says we've received our punishment. Again, what this has is this notion of finite human beings can only take so much. And once they've reached their limit, God's not saying, well, suck it up. You got more coming to you because you, you did me wrong. God says, I recognize human limits. And at that limit of punishment, at that limit of suffering, that's the end of it. There's an end to suffering, is the point. There's an end to suffering in the sense that it has purposiveness to it, hopefully, because it's supposed to change us. But B, quite literally, suffering has an end. It has a limit, and after it comes redemption. O al kol panim gam im lo yizku. Even if we don't deserve it, says God. Yigalenu bezmana kavua lachen amar nechama kifula. We will be redeemed at an affixed time, and thus it says nechama twice. It says comfort twice. The excess of comfort is saying that love comes that, com that redemption comes even without desert. Thoughts? Mm, okay. Right. Well, I saw Susie is saying Susie, suffering so should have an end, but what about people who can't let suffering go? So I say, you know, on one hand, we're talking, and that's like a subjective versus objective question, <laughs> right? And the question then of self-perpetuated suffering maybe is something that we have our own hand in. But when it comes to something that's even outside of us, God is saying even that has a limit. So there is a notion of, right, like when it comes to what you inflict upon yourself, that probably has no end. But this is more like a, an ought rather than a descriptor, right? It's saying suffering, suffering actually should have an end. And thus, if it doesn't, that's actually something to pay attention to. Again, that moves us from suffering to punitiveness, to cruelty. But I think cruelty reality, is not tolerated. Oh, no, it's okay. Yeah, Lauren? No, I was going to say in reality, people are pushed beyond what a human can take. Just think of it show up. I mean, it's just, you know, uh, 
many who survived survived at a cost. They were psychologically damaged. They they may have you know they went on. They had families. They they got jobs, but they were. I mean, my dad had nightmares his entire life. It was just you're you're never back to where you were before. Right. And I certainly had neighbors who were in and out of. Um, in and out of a hospital, I mean, one even needing uh, electroconvulsive therapy because the depression was so bad because of what they saw. And this is the first time. I mean, the Jews have been through it with the Spanish Inquisition, with the Crusades, with the pogroms. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're suffering all over the world. Like, the notion isn't that terrible things don't happen, right? Like, if a person dies, that's not... Right. There's that's 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 unjustifiable. Right. Somebody dying because of because of cruelty, because of something that's unjust. But I think that people can be traumatized beyond the point where they snap right. back. And re so, and this is, so this is what I find so actually motivating, uh, what I find so provocative about this teaching. So as a description, it's obviously false. Right. In the sense that, like, we see suffering without end. <laughs> we see, and uh, or we see a notion in which people do take their suffering or have some kind of intra-subjective relationship in which their suffering is perpetuating. That's true. What this is, in my opinion, is a counter-teaching to that. It is saying a truth that's actually beyond experience, or that is under experience. Some a this is a crit a lovingly critical response. If your suffering is without end, something's wrong. I'm not saying something's wrong with you, because then that would just be more suffering. But something is like, something's wrong, right? That there's there's something actually that you're, that is not needed. That's not fair. That's not right. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. And I'm not, again, this isn't like, and if so, if you can't get past your suffering or what have you, then like something, you're, you're screwed up. Rather, actually what it is, is a deeply, I think, spiritually radical teaching that, and here's the point, love comes without dessert. I don't mean like cake, I mean deserving it. Love is not something you earn. Redemption is coming whether you earn it or not, says the volume. Comfort happens whether you're worth being comforted. That's the radical power of Nachamu. Now, again, this isn't a description. Like, you know, redemption isn't here now. Hasn't our suffering gone on too long? Hasn't the world's suffering gone on too long? Yes, of course. But we're in the middle of it. We're not at the end of it. So we're biased. But... The point here, though, is that to think of love as something that one needs to earn means that you misunderstand love's very nature and the nature of redemption. Redemption even comes when it is not deserved. There is a time that redemption comes. Comfort comes after the sad prediction. It is a law. That's the power of Nachman. It is not something that maps to our experience, to the way that people behave. Obviously, this is a divine law. This is the way it needs to be, and it's not yet. We need to create the world in which this is. Right? This is, again, this is, I, I, this is, and this is the way I see. All prophecy is not telling the way things are, but the way things need to be. That's maybe a good summary good takeaway from this six-week class that we've done is that prophecy is in either like in its judgment sense its critical sense or in this loving comforting sense both actually providing a dialectical vision a vision of the way things need to be versus the way things are whether so, it's yes so comfort would be when mashiach comes is that the general idea then we're, we're i mean i think I think well, that's the literal the reading of what the Malbi was talking about. Yes, but I want to okay. try to I want to try to expand from that. Okay. Right, that is, the Malbi is giving us actually a really powerful teaching about love. 
that love is something that is offered des despite desert. You comfort the mourner because they are because they need it, not because they deserve it. Israel is suffering, thus you comfort it. Not Israel is suffering, thus you need to continue the punishment to make sure they learn their lesson. God will redeem them at the set time. That's why it says Nachmu twice, even if they aren't meritorious. <sighs> Love comes without dessert. Um, I tried to, yeah, Renee. Um, I, I'm kind of reading this differently, and maybe you can tell me if the Hebrew translates in this way at all, because, um, my question is, like, this seems to be a one-way street. God is comforting us. But my question is, who is comforting God? And because it's, it's, also, it's a disconnect for God also, right? He wants to have connection with us. He said, you guys messed it up, and we're divorcing now. It's something you explained in one of the last classes. Um, so, um, when you're looking at like, who's like you were saying, like we should look at the voice and like where, who's speaking to who. So when it says comfort, comfort, you prophets comfort my people. Oh, that's pretty obvious. Um, oh, can you go back up to where the Isaiah, the original Isaiah is so that I can see? It says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. So who is supposed to speak tenderly to Jerusalem? Is it oh. the prophet speaking to the people? Or is, it he, or is the prophet saying, hey, you guys, you need to be comforting, like, you know, you need to be comforting God also. Oh, very interesting. Okay, well, who do you think? I kind of feel like... Um, it's supposed to go both ways, and that's why it says comfort twice. Oh, comfort's going this way, comfort's going the other way. Like, we should mm -hmm. be, you know, I don't know if the, the Hebrew translates that way, though. Like, is it more like, speak tenderly to Jerusalem? Like, we as a people should be speaking, you know, to, uh, you know, to Jerusalem, God, or should... Well. Who's speaking in this, right? So let's pay attention. Yeah, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Like, no, but it says clearly, we, 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 know, we know who's speaking. It says it very clearly. It says you are God. Right. So, who's, so God is speaking through Isaiah, but instructing Isaiah to say this, right? So here's the king. Isaiah is saying this verbatim to the people because it's your God. Yeah. So if Isaiah, like I'm Isaiah, and I'm saying, speak tenderly to Jerusalem, then is that the instruction or is that what's coming out of his mouth? And he said, no, no, I, so, should be no I think it's, I think it's actually, I mean, I'll put this way. I'm not going to say one cannot read it whatever way, but here's the way I'm reading it. Nachmu nachmu ami yomar So the fact that it's addressed in the second person, Right, your God means that Isaiah is speaking all of this to Israel. Yeah. But quoting God to them. Right? Okay, so Isaiah he's quoting, quoting God to them. What God told Isaiah to say to the people, to the people. It's meta. So Isaiah yeah. is quoting what God told Isaiah to say to the people. And thus is replaying this interchange that Isaiah had with God. Yeah. And Isaiah is showing them that God is telling Isaiah to comfort the people, i.e., as an agent of God. So the people are being comforted by God. Right. So I was, uh, I'm just wondering though, because it's because of the ambiguousness of it. Of who the speaker could be, like if I was if I was standing there listening to Isaiah, uh, 
And he said, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. It almost sounds like a command to us. Like we, we need to be also. Oh, no, I see what you're saying. It's in the it's in the third person, but I'm just wondering. Like, so I guess my question is, yeah, who's comforting God? Great question. So, like, is that coming or? <laughs> so I think. Okay, so I want to say nobody. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is not because I want to like detract from the um detract from this like beautiful dialogism but rather to say like the primary sufferer now after the invasion of the babylonians and the romans and the nazis is us like we're the ones suffering really now right and then for god to go like wait i need your care and attention after you did this to me like that would be definitely a hallmark of like an abusive relationship so I, 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 in this case, I, God is not asking for our comfort. God actually is providing comfort after this has happened. Um, and I think actually that's really important that God does that. Now, what's not, what we're not being asked of here, we are the recipients of care, of care that we need after having gone through a terrible tragedy. Uh, B, what we do have in future ritual like Tikkun Chatzais, which was a mystical Kabbalistic practice of getting up at midnight and mourning the exile of the Shechina, is not comfort for God, but empathy with the Shechina who goes into Gullus with us, who goes into exile with us. But in that case, what we're not doing is pitying God or comforting God, i.e. like denying our experience, but by identifying with the Shechina, it's actually a matter, it's a, it's a means of expanding our consciousness through empathy. So that's different than, than like comforting God, right? We are the victims here. We are the recipients, we are the deserving, well, deserving is the wrong word, but we are the needing, the vulnerable recipients of comfort. Right, I think again, it's it's it is an, it's an affirming. Even though Tisha B'Av is a very hard day, no one denies it's awful. The, there's a real difference between Yom Kippur and Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is not a day of self improvement. Even though we talked about tshuva in advance of it, we don't say tachanun on Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is not a day of self critique and growth. Tisha B'Av is a day of mourning. Tisha B'Av is a day of acknowledging what was lost, not a day of blaming ourselves. It's a day of expressing regret and sorrow, but not a day of self-critique. And comfort comes after that. Comfort comes after the loss. Yeah, uh, Eugene. Um, just to kind of piggyback, I guess, on Renee's qu question. Um, when I, I guess, first heard of, uh, when I was listening to your, uh, uh, I guess you break down Isaiah 15, 119, I think it is, um, where there's a response, I guess, um, uh, to, the, to, to the trauma that we just experienced. And sometimes it's, I guess, difficult to make sense of. And in a way, I guess it kind of feels like you're kind of screaming into a void. And I guess that void would be the response from God itself, no? Yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting way of putting it, right? That here what we have in God's questioning or God's, what is actually in a way God's acknowledging the incommensurability of trauma, right? Of that experience of loss, of pain. It's something that's just, it's uncategorizable at that moment of, traumatizing experience right and it's inexpressible guess, in its very nature okay. so what we have then afterwards is in a sense not not ever something that can ever explain it or justify it or even commit or be commensurable with it but all we have is the opportunity to respond or that sorry all that one has in responding to someone who has lost someone grieving is to respond with love with comfort 
And, I mean, and very clearly, actually, as we learn in the laws of, of, of Nechum Avelim, there's halachas about this. You are not allowed to, like, do tzidu kadin. You're not allowed to justify what has happened to them. You're not allowed to do that. That was what the, that's what uh, Job's friends tried to do. And those are the negative examples. You don't go and say, well, you know, it's all for the best. You go and you actually aren't even allowed to speak first. You need to only be responsive to someone. Comfort follows the loss. I mean, both in terms of it's posterior to it, but also it follows the lead of the loss. Um, Ibn Ezra makes a comment about this very beautiful phrase, Dabru alev, speak to the heart or speak with comfort. La'olam dibur alev lahasir ha'etzev ha'daiga sha'avra. The expression to speak to the heart means to speak kindly, to remove the sorrow and regret for things which have already passed. So it's not, I think, again, like it, it, what he does not mean is to rewrite someone's experience, but rather what he's talking about is to provide kindness, which is then able to hopefully be a new uh, building block or new standing ground firmer ground to stand on, right? The, the love and kindness that you need, that's what is needed after, after the devastating experience of loss. To speak with kindness, that's the key I see here. Lhasir ha'etzev adayga shavra. Okay. So what we see is a sentiment of comfort of, of God commanding Isaiah to represent God's provision of comfort to the people following this devastating experience of loss, in which two things are, are communicated. One, that comfort is something that they don't need to earn, but they are owed. And B, that sin is something that is fulfilled, that is exhausted. Right, that sin is not something that stains you forever, but rather sin is something you either learn how to get rid of through, through tshuva, or it works its way through you like a cold, like a stomach bug, something like that. Lahavdil. But the point is that sin is something that happens to you, it is not something of you. We get the difference between those two things? Right, that the like, it's kind of classic Greek philosophy, right, that it's something that's essential or something that's accidental. Sin is never seen as something essential in the prophetic theology. Very important difference than, again, like a, like, the, like a doctrine of original sin. Sin is accidental in the sense that it is the result of something that has occurred. And because of that, it is something then that also goes away because of occurrences. Okay, so here we have a shift, and it's a seemingly strange shift. As we move from this like beautiful sentiment of, of to speak to the heart, to, that God is coming with love, speaking gently and, and, and kindly to the people, um, with comfort after a, a devastating loss, to now this like flamboyant, like even ebullient image of kol korei bamidbar, panu derech Hashem. A voice rings out in the desert. Clear a path for God. Yashrub Arava Mesila Lelokenu. Blaze a trail for God in the wilderness. What? What? What is? What an odd and seemingly a disjunctive transition. Let every valley be raised, every hill and mount made low. Let the rugged ground become level and the ridges become a plain. So first of all, I just want to make sure we get what the uh, image is here. I don't know if you've done any like serious landscape architecture. Renee, you've done some serious landscape architecture recently. What's the what's the main image that is being described here? They they have to start rebuilding. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Say more. <laughs> Was, uh, um, I guess it's just, it seems like, um, you know, 
that God will come, but they have to provide provide a way for God to show up. Well, here's a question. Is what Isaiah is describing possible? I mean, before like the age of like big diggers and caterpillars and, and the like. But then it's a metaphor, it's not literal. Okay, so yeah, so he's speaking in imagery right now. It's flattening, he's talking about flattening up. Okay, so what we're talking about, yeah, it's, it's changing top the mountains. It goes changing topographical diversity, right, into a into a clear line of sight. And that's the key, right? Mountains and valleys are things that do what? They're things that obstruct sight. Right. If you're in a valley, you can't see much beyond it. If you're on a, if you if you're before a mountain, then you, the mountain obstructs your view. And yeah. there's something that obstruct journeys. Right? Like, like go down a valley, go around a mountain, you can't go through it, I have to go around it, right? So let every valley be raised, let every hill and mountain be made low. Okay, so that seems like something that, at least with their technology in, what, the 6th century BCE, was not something that was available to them. Now, Rene took a more, like, activist, humanist take on this, that this actually is a call to responsibility, a call for the people to put in the work. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's, that is a definitely, that is definitely a valid reading. Um, <laughs> uh, but at least for, at least my immediate take on it, and again, this is just my take on it. I'm not saying this is what, how you have to read it, but I do see it as something that Isaiah is describing something miraculous because it's not, I think actually like the people are being told to do this per se, because if they were, then that would be, um, a cruel and unusual task. But rather, what we're talking about is 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 um, is the experience of expansiveness, of what it feels like when things that are obstructing or obstructious, obstructive, are out of the way. Now, again, this is not the same thing as rem as getting rid of an experience of trauma or of loss but rather it's describing what it feels like when something starts to ebb. When the experience of something crushing you, weighing you down, right? And what Isaiah is promising is, a, is the openness of a brand new day. That the desert, that, the, that there will be a highway made in the desert <laughs> and God is like roaring down it in God's Harley or what have you. The presence of the Lord shall appear, and all flesh as one sh Oh, that's a weird. Nigla kavod Hashem v'ra'uchol basar. I guess that's quite right. All the meat will see as one. Ki pi Hashem diber. All, all, um, all, like, mortal beings. The point is, like, all things uh, with fleshy bodies. Ki uh, pi Hashem, because it is the mouth of God that speaks. Kol omer kra v'yamar. Ma ekra kol basar chatsir kol chasto kitsisa sadeh. A voice rings out. A voice keeps on ringing out. That's what voices do, apparently. And another says, "What shall I call? What shall I call, cry out?" Kol habasar chatsir. Okay, so it's kol habasar that's seeing it, and kol habasar chatsir. Kol habasar means all flesh, but again, it means all mortal creatures. All mortals are like grass. V'chol chastoi kitsitsa sada, and all of its goodness is like flowers of the field. Grass withers, blossoms fade, but ki here usually means because or for, but here it means but. It's a contrast. When the breath of God, the spirit of God, Nashvabo, blows, Achein Chatsir Ha'am, the people are still grass, Yavesh Chatsir Naveltzitz, grass withers and blossoms fade, but the word of God stands forever.
I, I wouldn't say what this is is something you should ever say to someone in mourning. But what I take this part of the prophecy to be is, again, a truth that defies experience. Not just defies experience, but a truth that actually, in a sense, undercuts all experience. This is a very, like, Buddhist-style prophecy in the sense that it is fundamentally grounding all human experience in transitoriness. All flesh is like grass, blossoms fade. That what we experience is bound by time and it is real in its moment, but then also only for that moment. It is not, again, something that lingers. It's not something that has lasting power ultimately. Now again, again, this is not something I would say as a, you know, as a spiritual leader, you should not go and tell this to people at, at a shiva call. This is like a stoic prophecy in the sense that it is trying to help us understand something. And I think it's actually a really deeply powerful lesson that I wouldn't say is obviously comforting, but actually in some ways responds, I think, in a way both to what Lauren and Susie were bringing up before in terms of self-perpetuation. The notion that something is permanent is wrong. And thus, the more we relate to it as something permanent, the more we're committing ourselves to a false belief. Only God, who is beyond time, space, history, is lasts. Everything else doesn't. This is like a, a spiritual kick upside the head in a way. <laughs> but it is only because of this that we believe what we said before. That sin is exhausted. Right? That sin can be something that ends, not something that stays. This is the, this is the explanation of that. That there's nothing in human experience, no matter how much it tries to convince us otherwise that lasts. Now, I don't mean that I don't think what that does is actually cheapen human experience. It makes it all the more precious. Either in terms of the joy as it comes in its moment, its reality in that moment, and also the pain in moments, which is real and true. But what is not contained in those experiences are claims towards eternity. It's kind of like a harsh following to this, like, speak to the heart of Jerusalem. Grass fades and flowers fade. Grass, grass dies and flowers fade. Right? But I mean, that is actually what makes a flower so beautiful is how tender and time-bound it is. Like a flower is there for but a, what, two weeks? You, know, you, find you find the trees are blossoming. You want to cry. Because they're beautiful because they're leaving. What it is is a radical call to attention. To be attentive and in that responsive to what that is, to that experience. But what's different is it's not a call to metaphysics to say that this is real and must be preserved forever. People who try to do that are actually breaking the cycle. Flowers need to fade. That's how trees live. If flowers didn't fade, there wouldn't be pollinating. And trees would die. And Rashi, I think, actually, Katonti, I think intuits the same thing, in the sense that Rashi is noting that death is central to what it means to be alive. Now, I, I'm not saying this is a sense of a bummer. If, 
recognizing that is a radical because it imbues your whole life with such sanctity and urgency. Rashi says, a person's end is to die. Soif adam lamus. Lefichach. Therefore, he says to do kindness, he's like a blossom in the field that is cut off and dries. One must not rely. For he has no power to fulfill his promise. Perhaps he will die. Okay, so if somebody... This is like, you know, like real, like, kind of hard-nosed lesson. But I want to, like, read it against it. Like, the, the simple reading of the Rashi is that, like, listen, people die. And because of that, they can't be relied on. Who knows? They're like, listen, buddy, I'll, I'll help you move your car. And then they die. Like, come on. But I don't think that's actually really Rashi's point. I, th I think... I think, rather, it is what we're saying. Like, remember what it's like to experience a flower. A person's kindness is like a flower, in that it is beautiful, and it is present, and it is time-bound. That's what it means to be alive. And God is offered, then, as this contrast for a love that is always present in a way, because it is the very condition for life. God's grass withers and flowers fade, but the word of God is always fulfilled. It's fulfilled. The word of God always stands. The word of God lasts. Yes, there are things that happen within life. Flowers, grass, leaves. But life itself is the constant. So there's something actually like I'm, I, this is a this is a reading against Rashi in a sense, but I'm like I'm taking up Rashi's point, but I want to take the implications of it. There's something like tragically beautiful about a person trying to be kind, because of how contingent life is. You don't know what's going to happen to you. You don't know what is going to limit your ability. You don't know what's going to make you fade. And the valiant effort of the blade of grass sprouting its way through concrete to bloom in that way. It's incredible. It's an incredible act of heroism, but it's ultimately tragic. But what's being offered here through the prophecy is, I want to call it a counterfactual love. It is a love that is always true despite. It is a way to change our perspective when we're able to remember to change what we think we are and what we think we deserve when we're able to remember. That, you know, no matter how many flowers fade, no matter how many people disappoint you, the love of God, which is the source of all life, is something that can't be done away with. And even though it's paradoxical in the sense that if God is at the heart of what happened to us in Jerusalem, if God was ultimately the cause of these things, then how could God also be the comfort? Well, isn't that life? How could I have moments of deep crushing despair and then also have moments of soaring joy? How could I do something that I wish I could take back and then also do something that I'm so glad I was able to do, to fulfill? It's not about consistency. It's about holism. It's the fullness of life. Eicha and Nachma. The challenge and the love the loss and the comfort. It's all part of it. There's something like tragically beautiful about like w relating to what happened in Tishabov not as 
you know, ex post facto as something that needed to happen. And the way you respond to something that needed to happen is with the same kind of like resigned acceptance in a sense. That just as in a sense, we accept that God accepted in a sense that it had to happen. And in that acceptance accepts us. Oh, you know, Lahav deal elf of dollars. This is obviously a silly example, but like someone says like, like I, oh, the way, you know, ah, uh, the way that they chew their food drives me crazy. Like what's a greater expression of love than that? Because it's the acceptance of something that drives you nuts as bound together with the, with the person that you love. Right? It's not an expression of love to say, oh, you know, they never make me mad. That's about you. That's not about them. That's about how convenient it is for you. Because you know what's the, the hidden dark side of that statement is, what if they make you mad? Right? What if, it, what if your fantasy is ruined? Because the fantasy is based on your your stakes, but you know to say like something like there's something beautiful about about a resigned acceptance. <laughs> oh, that's how they are, ha ha ha. Because what it means is you know what I accept and what I believe and what I commit to that this person is a part of my world. And the question now, in a sense, is well, how do I deal with that? Not do I do away with them. This is such a beautiful. Okay, so now we've moved. We've you know we've 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 reached this topographical landscape metaphor of the desert, the wilderness being leveled out, being made flat for God to travel on, so God can get to us quicker. I think that's a point too, right? That like every construction, everything's getting out of the way, so that God is going to be present. God will be revealed. And now you know, even though we got rid of the mountains, now there's mountains again. It says, go to the top of the mountain, O herald of joy. Herald of joy, Vaseris Sion. Uh, it doesn't say joy. That's that's the translation adding something in. The herald of Jerusalem. Harimi b'koach kolech. Say it loud and say it proud, baby. Vaseris Yerushalayim. Harimi al tirai. Do not be afraid. It says, have no fear. To, it seems like to raise the flag, but I don't, I actually think, what's the message? The message is you don't have to be afraid your whole life. Right, that's a message to actually, like, that, listen, again, that's not something I would say you should say to someone suffering from trauma. But that's the hopeful takeaway, eventually, for somebody who has, is to learn that they don't need to be afraid their whole life. <laughs> to not have to inflict on themselves fear. Behold your God. Remember I said prof, uh, prophetic texts are poetic and poetic texts are parallel? Saying don't be afraid, right? Harimi alti rai imri la'are Yehuda hine alokehem. Say to Jerusalem, raise it up, don't be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, that's parallel to Jerusalem, here is your God. What is God identify, identif what is God parallel with? Not being afraid. Not that God is not afraid, obviously, but that the appearance of God, which is technically known as a theophany, that the appearance of God is parallel to not being afraid. The full embrace of life again. Healing that allows for living. <laughs> Life and death are bound up. We saw that in the Rashi. It's life and fear that are opposites. Hine Hashem bechazak yavo zro mashlayo hine sechara ito filasolofanav. God is coming with God's like full strength, and God's arm is winning triumph. Like this is just a vision of victory. This is like this is hashtag winning, right? This is like you. I mean, again, like this is, I think this is really, in a sense, prophecy as fantasy, but not fantasy in the sense of what's not real, but fantasy as an imagination of what else could be. What trauma does to us is it doesn't, I mean, we experience this, is it doesn't just limit 
our, let's say, our bandwidth, it doesn't just limit our range of experiences because of fear or what have you. It also limits what our imagination is able to conjure up because it's so determined by what we think is necessary. Trauma is a commitment to what is be believed to be necessary. And hence the response that all things are transitory. Things pass, people change. One awful experience cannot control your life. And I'm not saying that in a way, in any way, shape, or form to correct or anyone who's suffering from PTSD or what have you. But rather, I'm speaking again from the, from the vantage point of should. It should not be the case that people's lives are commanded by this. It can't be the case. It's, it, 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 we must do everything we can in our power to make sure that people have the opportunity to heal. <laughs> That's the key. And this is, and, uh, even though we're not getting to the end of the Haftorah, this is actually where we're going to stop our, our dive into it with this incredible line. Kiroya et ro yireb zroa yekabetz tulayim v'cheko yisa alos yinahel. It's, uh, there's a similar line, actually, also from Isaiah, if I remember correctly. Kivakaras ed ro, ro ed ro, uh, kivakaras, yeah. ro ed ro, um, like a, like a shepherd shepherding their flock. So here we have, like a shepherd of, of their flock, shepherding with their, with their own arm. Yekabetz tulayim uvecheko yisa. Gathering in the lambs and, ne and nestling them under your chin, tucking them under the crook of your arm. Yisa alos yinahel. Drive uh, gently, guiding the mother sheep. So before we get into the commentaries, and I have a couple about this. How do you just like relate to this image? I mean, I, I put in the qu question to you, but I, I see it as a return for the exile, you know, as this, this wonderful comfort of, you know, you're, you're ascend the mountain. I mean, you know, when you, when you take the train or you're driving up to Yerushalayim, you're going up and used to be more that you smelled the forest, but there's not much left of it, unfortunately. But it's just, you know, there's a joyful feeling of, of working your way up to Yerushalayim. And I can imagine for people who have been exiled to be able to come back to the land and to feel that Hashem is protecting them, that they're finally, it's okay, you can come back. And, um, and it's a beautiful image of, of Hashem as a shepherd, like carrying them like little baby lambs, you know? Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful image of... Um, of finally reaching like kind of um, almost like a messianic time, but I think oh, like, yes, yeah, yeah. No, so so the the, the back half of Isaiah especially is deeply messianically attuned, and it's these visions of redemption that are so so powerful and so vivid. What I think I want to say is like what I see in this little chunk, and it, it's something actually that the that the Masoretes also recognized as a chunk because here we have actually a, like an end of a paragraph. Sus, sus, this means satum instead of patuach. It means like it's the end of a line, but it's still the end of a section. Is what we have in this beginning seems to be like, oh yeah, like everything's over, everything's fine. Like God is a, God is coming with like trumpets and a full brass band. Everything's cool. Raise your voice up high with power, right? And it's like it's like it never happened, right? It seems like listen, redemption is here. It's all fine. But that's I think like you're you're getting rooked in a sense because I think with this last line, that's what the vision of triumph is. The vision of triumph isn't charging forward and not worrying about whether you can keep up. The vision of God's return is one of care and attentiveness and one of deep, um, I would say, like the equalizing that comes with care. Right, you know, you talk to actually people who work with children in terms of pedagogy of early childhood, and there's a very big difference when it, between somebody leaning over a kid and talking at them and crouching down and talking to them. 
right? To bring yourself down and to equalize yourself with a child, literally bring, it, bring yourself to their level. To look at them as equals, right? In the same eyesight. So what is, what's going on here? A shepherd pasturing their flock, gathering lambs, tucking them in, nestling them close. It's a beautifully tender image. And it's not worth forgetting, it's very much worth remembering that the Mashiach is called a shepherd, King David was a shepherd, all of the patriarchs and matriarchs were part of shepherding households. A shepherd is coterminous with leadership. And the leader is one of attention and care, not one of, you know, hard-charging power, but one of attention and one of comfort. And Suis David says, explaining the image of the shepherd, that God's a shepherd who shepherds their flock with gentleness, gathering in the lambs with their arm, not with a staff, right? with their arm, with God's actual arm, metaphorically, with God's symbolic arm, bearing the smallest of them in the crook of their arm, leading them with gentleness. So does the omnipresent guide Israel in gentleness in their returning from exile. Again, what's so, what, what, what makes such a deep impression on me in this is that it seems like it pivoted out of this theme of comfort by focusing on God's incommensurability. Like, oh, what you've experienced was hard, and I'm sorry, but you know what? All experiences fade. I'm the one who lasts, so fix your brain and you'll be fine. But I think that's actually not at all the point. The point of God's incommensurability is to show how uniquely positioned God is in terms of providing the impossible, which is an ever-present love. All sources of love in our life are conditional and contingent in some way, shape, or form. Yes, we might have people in our lives that love us unconditionally or what have you, but either they, you know, chas v'shalom, we lose them, or they have a lot of other things in their life too and they're not always available for you. They're not always available to take care of you. That's just the way life is, and like a mature, loving relationship recognizing that. It doesn't, it's not threatened by that, and that's good. We should develop that mature sense of understanding. But when it comes to God, you know, and to, I think, Renee's question before, I think actually, in a way, the very point is that God, is not ask, God does not need our comfort. God is providing comfort unconditionally and non-contingently. That's what makes God so unique. And it is not just, again, God's like justice, like, okay, you've done your, you've done, you know, you did the crime, you've done your time, and now it's redemption. But what comes after loss is care, is the gentle shepherd picking us up and nuzzling us close. That's the image of God triumphant, not beyond us, but bearing us. Not a transcendent, but tender. Uh, let's see a chat. Uh, you know, it's, a question, it's an interesting question, Susie, in terms of is God gaining comfort by, by us healing? I think, listen, I, you know, I'm not going to put words in the prophet's mouth vis-a-vis -vis God. But I think, like, I really want to push this idea. That the, 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 the message that is being communicated here is one of God's self-sufficiency. And I want, like, I... I you know, we did a lot of actually learning about like kind of more vulnerable images of God, you know, especially in Kabbalah and early, in earlier parts of the year. But here, actually, I really do think here what God is providing is a fantasy of something that we don't get in reality, which is someone who doesn't, who, someone who doesn't need and is just there to provide. Like that's, I mean, I want to be very clear, that's no one in our lives. That's no one in human life. 
maybe the re maybe like a rebbe, maybe a tzedekes, maybe like someone like a saint. But what the what's being said here is actually like God is saying, you know what really only matters? You. In this moment, after you're in pain, you are the one that matters. And I'm here for you. Rashi also expands in this image of the shepherd. It's, it's so beautiful. God is like a good shepherd who shepherds their flock and gathers in the little lambs so they no longer wander. Oh, sorry, it's Radak, David Kimchi. No longer, wa no longer wander like the other animals, gathering them one by one. So care and comfort here is not just like a general principle. It is something that is tailored to each individual where they are, what they need. Bearing them in the crook of their arm. Their mothers would lead them gently, not pushing them. So the, so the Holy One leads Israel from exile gently, supporting the sick and the broken. I think what's so, what's so, what impresses me so much, what like makes a deep impression on me about this, is that it is a, it is a counter message. You'd think, after being punished for sin, those who were punished the worst would be the ones who were the who, who deserve the least. And who was punished the worst? Well, people who, after the Babylonians swept through Jerusalem, are sick and broken now. Wouldn't that be evidence that they are not deserving of love or care? That they deserved what was happening to them? No, because love and deserving don't go together. God brings a special love to those who hurt the most. Right? The inversion of power is a constant theme in the prophets. That God's, that the, the amazing quality of God's power is not that God, is precisely this point, that God does not need, but rather provides. And that God lowers God's self, Kivyachol, to the lowest level to take care of those who need it the most. This is an incredible point. And the Radak quotes, who I think is his father, he says, the uh, Adoni Avi Zal Dik says, why is it the word edro? Why is it in the possessive? And the answer is because one cares deeply for the flock that is one's own, more than the flock one is paid to mind. This is not like God was, like this is not a wage laboring job. God is attentive because, I mean, think about what it means to have your own flock, right? You are not like a, a like a, you know, you're not brought in on like Wednesdays, Mondays to Wednesdays, to, you know, every other week to take care of this flock. This is a flock you have grown up with. You know every one of the lambs' names. You know how they, how they walk. You know what they eat, right? There's a, there's a through line of attentiveness. Yeah. I mean, like, anyone who got a pandemic dog and didn't, like a monster, return them to the shelter. We see the people like returned pandemic dogs to the shelters. Very angry. Um, but imagine what it's like, right? Like, to, to the, just the, the basic, the radical tenderness of attention. Of just to be attached to someone, to something. And to have who they are in their specificity be so present to you that we are those tender objects of God's concern. I, 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 want, I, I guess I'm just like pushing back, and I don't mean to like say one is right or wrong. Like, you know, one is welcome to have that synthetic reading of like God gaining something through this. I'm, the reason I'm pushing this, not put whatever, the reason I am advocating for this reading is because I think what I'm trying to offer is an option. And it's an option of God's total commitment to care for us. In which we can actually let ourselves go into that. That we don't need to worry about if we're being good enough in receiving love. I think we do that a lot, actually. When we have to never stop performing, never stop worrying, am I earning this? Are they going to run away? Am I too needy? Am I too much? Am I too in pain? Am I letting them too inside? 
with human beings, unfortunately, I mean, I mean, fortunately, in the sense that, like, the reason we have to ask those questions is because, like, there's another human being on the other end of it, and they have needs, too, and it's not just you. But with God, it is just you. And it is, what I think it is, is the commitment to the, to the truth that your pain matters on its own front, that your loss deserves care and with no conditions or contingencies. That it is unqualifiable. It is absolute. With God. And God provides that truth. And that's a truth you can take with you. And that's a truth you can hold in you. And it's a truth you can affirm for yourself. Because God provides that affirming, that, that, that assurance. It's not a truth that you can ever get from anyone else. You can feel loved by others. Don't get me wrong. But you will also be disappointed by others. And I'm not saying that to like discount human love. I'm saying like what it means to love is to learn also to forgive. But this is a space that God is carving out in which we can actually have this time time alone, time with God, time with our souls, in which we can provide ourselves actually a, a kind of assurance that we that we are gleaning from God's promise. I think we often, in a sense, look towards what we can't, look to sources that can't provide for what we need. We have so much coming, we have so much love coming at us in this world. We have so much bounty coming at us in this world. And we can't help but check it. Whereas there's a kind of acceptance that I, that, I, that I read in this Haftorah that I think God is trying to provide. A promise that despite anything, you are worthy. No matter what you've gone through, no matter what you think you deserve, no matter how broken you think you are, that God's love is never something you can ever lose. It's never something that you don't get. And we have all this like incredible verbiage about like who measured the waters, who measured the skies, who measured the earth, right? Like in the it's it's very Jobian. I don't know if you like the thing about like who were you there when I planned the universe, right? But the point of it is because that's like that that kind of paradoxical miracle miraculousness. That's actually what this means to have pure love. That God is so unlike anything else. That this love is never something you can condition away it's not something that's it's not comparable so to go back to the point above like who can you compare me to says god who can you equate me to says the holy one the reason is because there's nothing comparable to this and because there's nothing comparable to this there's nothing that can that can um that can do away with it. There's nothing that's on that, that's able to engage in that way to like undercut it. If even us being, going through the ringer of Tishabov isn't enough to lose God, despite all of the critics who said that's what it means, right? People look at Tishabov at the loss of Jerusalem and say, look, you've lost your God. God's left. God broke up with you. You're divorced. Get over it. You're bereft. You don't deserve it. God comes afterwards and said, and says, I'm so sorry that you're in pain, and I'm here. That's the comfort. There's nothing that can happen that separates us. Behold, Sarah, some lights are. In all of our troubles, God is troubled. The message that is being communicated here, this message of comfort, is ultimately one of empathy. That God is with us no matter what. Even if we see God as being the cause, as being the, the, the designer of what's going on, you know, God is the source of everything. God is in it with us too. In a way, that's the greatest comfort of all. In all the trouble that God is bringing us, you know, Rosh says it quite clearly, 
But God did not trouble them. Didn't trouble them according to their deeds that they deserve to suffer for the angel da 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 da. Michael, minister for God, saved them always as an agent of the omnipresent. Our, what we deserve doesn't ultimately matter because comfort, God's connection, cannot be disconnected. It cannot be divorced from us. That's the power. It's so powerful that Rebbe Zera like shook and trembled. It's an, it is a world-shaking belief. And it's something that's especially, I think I want to say like, it's something that is an odd comfort in a way. Because it's something that is insisted on rather than evident. It is a truth that does not always map to our experience. It's a truth that in a way is despite our experiences. But it's a truth that helps open, crack open what it is that we're inside of and to help to start to get things moving again. To realize that what we experience does not define us. That what we feel is necessary is not necessarily so that it always holds open what else can be possible because of a love that will not go away. It's a commitment to the future, which I think really is what prophecy ultimately is about. The future here of the love is that there is a connection that doesn't go away, and because of that means that there's always another chapter. It's not a love story that ends. It has its ebbs and flows, but there's a constancy, which means that there's always something next. Ch Prophecy is a commitment to a future because it is trying always to help something continue. It's trying to help our relationship with God and our relationship with each other survive. It's either trying to help us see what it is that we're doing so that we can cause a course correction, or, and this is what we're seeing now, after the unspeakable happens, it comes with a resounding yet tender promise that whatever we've gone through is not the end, but that there's something else, and there's something more that's coming. Yeshkach.